Mr. President, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your reception, thank you for your invitation. It's a pleasure and honor for me to address such an audience. Uh, I have uh, attended part of uh, uh, this uh, morning's meeting and I am very impressed by the level and quality of your uh, debates. And uh, uh, I feel a bit awkward because uh, first, as you hear, English is not my native language and I am not, uh, um, I am not bilingual unfortunately. And I am not an academic, I am a politician. And I am a French. And my first contact with Irishmen was on a rugby playground. <laughs> it was a good memory. I lost this time. Uh, but I very much admire Ireland, uh, the fighting spirit, and I and we, we in Brussels, in the European Parliament, we in France, appreciate all the endeavors made by the Irish people uh, for the last two years. Before starting my, my speech, I would like to uh, pay tribute to old friends. I'm particularly happy to uh, to see uh, again uh, former President Pat Cox, of, former President of the European Parliament, and of course former Taoiseach John Bruton. Uh, we were uh, members of uh, the uh, European Convention 10 years ago, and he was particularly instrumental in devising what has become uh, the, the current uh, Lisbon Treaty. Uh, I have uh, just visited uh, several member states of the European Union uh, who uh, are now facing uh, difficulties. I was in uh, a few days ago in Rome, I was in Madrid. Uh, earlier this week, I was in uh, uh, Lisbon. Today, I am in Dublin. I won't go to Athens, it's hopeless. As long as they don't produce the real figures and as long as they don't make any efforts, it's pointless. If there are questions, I'm ready to answer. But here, it's very important. Here, it's very important because Ireland is a uh, uh, a very important member of the Eurozone. And uh, again, all the, all the efforts, all the endeavors you have been making uh, in the recent period must be supported. And I am very happy uh, to uh, hear that uh, last night or early this morning, the European Council has recognized that after these efforts, including after the remarkable referendum uh, recently, uh, the Irish efforts had to be uh, supported and backed uh, by the uh, European Union. Two points. First, the lessons of the crisis. There is an advantage in every crisis. They, have, they are lessons to be drawn, and we must build on the lessons or the, um, of what we can learn from, from the crisis. First, I don't know whether you, you have discussed this point, either during this uh, seminar or during a previous one, but there was an original mistake at the beginning of the Euro system over 10 years ago. And everybody made the mistake. The politicians, of course, we are only making mis we are always making mistakes. But also the academics, the bankers, the central bankers, the journalists, etc. When we uh, when we adopted the
the, the euro and uh, discarded our old national currencies, of course, there was unification of short-term interest rates. It was logic, it was healthy economically, with one single reference, the interest rates of the, the European Central Bank, of course, uh, the consequence was obvious for uh, uh, the interbank and short-term interest rates. But another phenomenon happened, which was unforecast and which remained unnoticed. It was a spontaneous approximation and almost unification of all the interest rates of the sovereign states, the, uh, the uh, um, public bond yields. And they approximate not down in the middle, the average between the higher, uh, the highest and the lowest, but at the lowest level, enabling those member states who previously had to pay uh, a spread relatively high as compared with uh, Germany or other uh, countries from northern uh, Europe to uh, uh, fund their debt uh, at a very low level, encouraging them uh, to fund their public finances, their investments, uh, but not only encouraging the states or uh, localities, but also private economic actors, uh, uh, banks, uh, enterprises, households, uh, to, uh, to fund all their projects uh, too much by debt. And it, this original mistake uh, brought about a kind of original sin in, not in all the members of the Eurozone, but in many members of the Eurozone, including, unfortunately, my own country. And this continued even after the Lehman Brothers crisis, until the end of 2009, until the, uh, the uh, uh, the problem, the Greek problem, when after an election, a general election in Greece, the newly elected government discovered that the uh, public figures uh, released by their predecessors were faked in an, uh, uh, an extraordinary uh, way. Uh, overtaking the usual standards of faking in Greece, if I can put it that way. And then suddenly, uh, the, the notation agencies, uh, the markets, uh, the financial operators, discovered that in spite of being members of the same currency area, well, there were the, the risks of national debts were different depending on the quality of the management of the different members of the zone. And it was the origin of the problems, of, of many problems we, uh, we meet uh, today. Second lesson from the crisis, the crisis has revealed that uh, the, 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 the level of our common interests is far higher than the most Europeans from uh, among us imagined, contemplated beforehand. A few examples. When there was a crisis here in, in Dublin, a, a few uh, weeks later, there were, there were direct consequences in, in Poland. Some Poles working here went back to their native country. When the crisis 
broke out in uh, uh, the UK, a first consequence appeared in France, in my region, in my constituency, the southwest, the Périgord, when we had to close down an airport because the, the direct uh, uh, air link between uh, London and uh, Bergerac uh, had uh, no, uh, no customers left due to uh, the, uh, the downfall of the pound compared with the euro. They, the, all of the retired uh, Englishmen uh, living in the southwest of France were ruined, so uh, we uh, closed the airport. Uh, another example. When the, the uh, German car industry met great difficulties due to the recession, the, the downturn of uh, 2010, uh, the, uh, the German government decided to, to give uh, grants to the customers of cars uh, who would uh, uh, buy uh, new cars uh, polluting less than the older ones. These grants were used by most of the beneficiaries, German beneficiaries, to buy not German cars, but cars built by, in Romania, by the subsidiary of the French car maker Renault. So the German taxpayers uh, paid for an increase in salaries and uh, creating jobs in Romania and uh, for uh, distributing dividends uh, in France. And a last example, it's not uh, only economics, but it's amusing and revealing. When last uh, summer uh, there was um, a, a, a lethal disease uh, caused uh, in, in northern um, uh, Germany, uh, caused by a, a production of soya beans germs two or three consumers died. Well, uh, it was a disaster for the Spanish production of vegetables because there was a kind of panic and nobody in Europe wanted to, uh, uh, to buy and eat Spanish cucumbers. So, you see, the crisis has revealed that now we live, exa we live exactly in the same market, in the same economic community. And last, uh, learn, uh, last lesson from, from the crisis, in this community of interests, community of destinies, unfortunately, uh, our uh, mechanism of solidarity uh, have not developed as fast as the community of interest. And uh, we uh, meet a lot of difficulties to try to adjust our common rules to this changing economy and these uh, uh, common uh, interests. And uh, uh, we have seen that uh, for the last two years, a lot uh, has been done by the European leaders. Uh, they held, they have held uh, almost 20 uh, uh, European summits, uh, uh, called uh, every time summits of the, the last chance, it's the last chance summit. Uh, it was the case last night. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, uh, we uh, note that uh, they need uh, a lot of time before taking the right decision. When the decision is taken, it takes a lot of more time to implement the, uh, the decision. And 
there is a very severe discrepancy between the time of financial markets and the political calendar in our national states and let alone at the European level. For instance, to give two examples, last July, almost one year ago, at a summit of the last chance, uh, there was an important decision taken to enlarge the possibility of intervention of the uh, European Fund of Solidarity, the FESF, and to make it more flexible. But, legally speaking, it was without the name, this agreement was without the name, a treaty. A treaty requires ratification by the parliaments of the interested states. The process of ratification was relatively rapid, according to our usual standards, but it took us three months and a half. Three months and a half, and uh, uh, it was relatively painful in some member states, and in particular, the ratification was got in Slovakia at uh, the expense of uh, the existence of the then gover Slovak government. They had to resign to obtain the ratification from their parliament. Three months and a half, it was too late for the markets. And so, uh, the uh, European leaders had to meet again in December uh, to take the same decision, but uh, uh, with a, a, a different wording. And it's then that they decided uh, to enshrine the political decision into a new treaty with an extraordinary name, Fiscal Compact. Compact is a word which has no meaning in no uh, known language, perhaps in Gaelic, I don't know, but... Uh, uh, fiscal Compact. The markets were reassured for 24 hours, but then it took three more months to draft the draft treaty, to, to translate into writing uh, the, the principle of this, uh, of this compact and the, ratifying, the, ratification, the ratifying process uh, is still going on. It is completed in your country. It's not in mine. I am not sure whether today the new uh, French president of the Republic uh, has officially stated that France would ratify. In the meantime, the markets are again worried and there are various movements on the markets. So, it's the first point. The lessons of the crisis. Good news, it's our common interests mean common destiny. And I, I fully agree with what John Bruton was uh, answering to a question uh, earlier. What about uh, uh, the uh, uh, possibility for a member of the Eurozone, uh, Greece or uh, somebody else, uh, to, uh, uh, to quit and uh, to come out of the Eurozone? It's absurd. It's impossible. We have made the omelette. When the omelette is made, we can't not digest, but we cannot retrieve the eggs. That's the good news. <laughs> Even if it's digestion sometimes. But that's the good news. The bad news is that we don't have the, the governance system uh, to uh, to run this uh, new kind of political entity. We have the Lisbon Treaty. It's a good treaty, but probably it's not enough. Our um, 
uh, our working method, uh, our um, decision-making process is clearly uh, too cumbersome, uh, too uh, complicated, uh, and too slow. That's why I propose to complement the uh, agreements already uh, reached at the EU level, but what, by what I call um, a model of solidarity in the EU, a solidarity pact for the EU. There is a fiscal pact. Uh, there, there is now a, uh, an agreement. I don't know whether they call it a pact or a compact uh, for, uh, in favor of growth. My recommendation is to complement by a solidarity pact, because clearly, if there is doubt on the markets, and which is at least uh, almost uh, so important, as important uh, uh, among our citizens, it's a doubt about the capacity of the countries forming the European Union or the Eurozone to show, to express their solidarity. And we have been trying for the last two years to invent this model of solidarity. A lot has been done, but now is the time to uh, complement uh, this, uh, this model. And uh, uh, this solidarity pact should comprise two elements, two arms, financial solidarity and fiscal solidarity. What does that mean? Financial solidarity, it's uh, the, the problem we, we have been discussing uh, since uh, the beginning of the, uh, of the day. Um, uh, my perception of what, the, what we are looking for in uh, uh, the uh, setting up of the, uh, these uh, uh, ESM, uh, uh, the fiscal uh, or, um, treaty or um, uh, fiscal compact, etc., uh, can be summed up in the motto one for all and all for one. One for all, what does that mean? We all agree to help one another if need be, but, but, on the condition that everyone makes most efforts to avoid uh, needing the aid of the others. We can agree on helping somebody if, before resorting to the help of the others, he endeavors to uh, help himself uh, and to, to save himself, one for all. And it's the aim of the fiscal compact or the fiscal treaty. Uh, every uh, member of the Eurozone has to commit solemnly to put is public finance in order so that in the long run he won't need any longer anymore the uh, the support of his uh, of, of his partners and in particular this rule this gold rule is necessary because of course it's not the case in Ireland but in many other countries, including mine, we tend to be very generous with other people's money. <laughs> Particularly with German money. Oh, we are very generous. And there are a lot of proposals. But we are democracies. We are democracies. 
we can convince the, some uh, partners, the Germans, the Dutch, the Finns, uh, etc., to be more generous towards the, re the rest of uh, Europe. We can explain and demonstrate, and rightly, that it's their interest, those who export a lot towards us, our deficits are their surpluses, and conversely. So their interest is that our growth uh, be uh, as high as, as possible, and so if we lack money, if, we, if, if they can lend us money, it's their interest. If they can lend. And as long as, as it is only loans. But we are democracies. They are democracies. We cannot, nobody, no, no authority, public authority elected can obtain from the electors, from their constituents, to pay taxes in place of taxpayers of other countries. I am not, I cannot in France convince my taxpayers to pay the taxes that the Greeks don't pay in their country. It's impossible. So we must understand that we can demand a lot from our partners, but there is a limit, a democratic limit which is the impossibility to convince the taxpayer of a member state to place in lieu of uh, the taxpayer of another ones. But, another one, but it's one for all. And the, uh, uh, in return for this commitment and these efforts, if in spite of these efforts, one country is in a, a very difficult situation. So, all the others have the, the obligation to uh, come to help. It is all for one. A lot has been done with the creation of uh, the uh, European Stability Fund. I am very happy to uh, learn, we have been told the, this morning, that last night uh, there, uh, there was uh, an agreement of principle to make this uh, fund uh, more flexible, to uh, empower uh, it uh, to uh, purchase at least uh, a secondary uh, public debt, and uh, to, um, uh, to uh, empower it also uh, to intervene directly in the capital of banks in uh, Spain and probably in other countries, including uh, the, the, this one. Um, uh, but uh, let's remember this philosophy, this principle, one for, for all and all for one. Alongside financial solidarity, we need fiscal budgetary solidarity too. And it is the second part of the, uh, what I called the Solidarity Pact of Europe. What is amusing, what is surprising is that while dealing with this uh, uh, financial crisis and debt crisis, our leaders have forgotten that there is something like a common European budget. And solidarity is a concept different from liberty, uh, equality, fraternity, uh, etc. It's not abstraction. It can be assessed, measured, very precisely. The amount of solidarity 
among a family, a city, a region, a country, a union of countries, is measured by the level, the amount, of the common budget. In a country like France, the solidarity is very high. When a, a French earns 100 euros, he pays uh, 44 euros of taxes or uh, other contributions, uh, almost half of the income. At the EU level, the EU budget accounts only for 1% of the EU GDP. So it's a very low level of solidarity. That's why we need to complement the EU budget by the financial solidarity, the e, uh, European Solidarity Fund, etc., or Stability Fund, etc., etc., invent a new model, but of course we must also use this basic instrument of solidarity, which, uh, which is the, our common budget. And now is the time, it's uh, an interesting coincidence, to start negotiating on the EU budget for the next seven years. You know that the EU budget is an annual budget, but it is devised and adopted in a multi-annual framework for a period of seven years. And we are now starting negotiating, negotiation between the European Parliament and the uh, European Council of Ministers, uh, European Affairs Ministers and Finance Ministers, for uh, the years 2014-2020. And my recommendation on the EU budget is the following. Of course, of course, we need a, an EU budget higher than today. But we must be realistic. It will be very difficult to reach a political agreement to increase sizably uh, the current level of this budget. We need to reach an agreement, unanimity of the 27 member states. So we are at the mercy of the less European-minded member state. Ireland is a very Euro-minded member state, but there are some islands not very remote from here, which are not in the same mood. No. Um, but at least we should try to adjust the current framework both on the expenditure side and on the revenue side. What does that mean? On the expenditure side, our small EU budget is focused on very important policies, particularly important for your country and mine, but which, uh, the, the content of which requires adjustment adaptations. It's the uh, common agriculture policy and what we call the regional or cohesion policy. And on these policies also we must draw the lessons from experience. The situation on the international food markets are changing very rapidly. In a world where Chinese uh, eat no longer rice but meat, including Irish beef, it's a different word as, uh, from uh, what it used to be 20 years ago. And uh, probably it requires some uh, shifts, some uh, adjustments uh, to the common agriculture policy. Likewise, on the cohesion funds, the cohesion funds are very important economically and politically because it's the instrument uh, whereby the 
richer member states help the poorer member states to uh, catch up. And it's important particularly for the Mediterranean country and Eastern European country. But the crisis has shown that some of these member states uh, waste the money with uh, some corruption. Other member states don't know how to use it. In Bulgaria or Romania last year, uh, they were able to uh, use only seven or eight percent of the funds they were allocated. And in other member states, my country, my region, my constituency, we waste the money into too many projects. Every year, in my region, the southwest, Aquitaine, Bordeaux, the wine, uh, and the, the Basque country, uh, the land, uh, the territory from Bordeaux to the, the Spanish border, three million inhabitants. Uh, we, we got grants from the reg European Regional Funds for 2,000 different programs, projects. Far too many, far too many, that's clear. Politically, it's good for us. We are popular in 2,000 communities. <laughs> but economically, it's not serious. So we have to focus, to use this small EU budget to focus our efforts on more efficient uh, uh, projects and programs, preparing the future, return to uh, competitiveness and to growth. And uh, alongside CAP and regional policies, of course, to fund research, new technologies, renewable sources of energy, etc., which uh, so far has not been uh, funded uh, sufficiently by the EU budget. That's it for the expenditure. And the last point is the revenue side of the budget. And there, we are in a very queer situation. We are violating the treaty. According to the treaty, from the first day of what we call the European construction, the Treaty on Steel and Coal Community in 1951, and then Treaty of Rome, uh, and until today's Treaty of Lisbon. It is laid down very precisely that the EU expenditure shall be funded by EU own resources. In public policies, own resources mean taxes. Either national taxes, which part of or all of them directly uh, earmarked for the uh, EU budget or a EU tax. Uh, initially, in 1951, and it was still the case when Ireland joined the, com the then common market, there, were, there was a federal tax without the name federal. But there was a tax on the output uh, of the um, uh, steel and coal companies. And uh, well, the, the revenue from this tax was relatively high. But then the European coal and steel community demised uh, in 2003, and today the only own resources allocated to the EU budget uh, is the customs duties. And the customs duties, well, in a world where everything uh, uh, circulates freely, uh, of course, uh, it's, it's not an important uh, revenue. That's why today the EU is funded by national contributions, meaning by national budgets. And given the situation of our national budgets, 
it is, of course, impossible to increase uh, the funding of EU policies. I, I cannot ask, uh, I cannot expect from the Irish finance minister, I have met this morning, uh, f from the, the Portuguese finance minister, nor from the French finance minister, we are in the same situation, to increase their contribution. So, uh, my recommendation, my proposal, which is now not a personal proposal, but a formal official proposal of the European Parliament uh, and of the European Commission, a proposal which is now on the table, which is negotiated in Brussels, which the negotiation has started a few months ago, is to replace the current national contributions by new own resources. Two different options are being uh, put forward, have been put forward uh, by the European Commission. First, the allocation of one VAT point directly to uh, Brussels, and the second one, the setting up of financial transaction tax, the revenue of which, or at least part of the revenue of which, could be earmarked to Brussels. If these options do not obtain the required unanimity among the 27 member states, and for instance, I understand that these ideas are not very, um, uh, very well accepted here. Okay, we don't mind in Parliament the option which is finally uh, accepted, but we need a solution, be it VAT, be it financial transaction tax, be it a carbon tax, be it another kind of tax. But it's the only way to be able to finance our common policies necessary to sustain growth and regain competitiveness while alleviating uh, the narrowing the, the, the burden uh, of the national budgets. And, and it will be my, 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 last, uh, my last remark, it's on, also necessary for political reasons, major political reasons. Of course, we know that today Europe, Europe as such, the European construction, is not very popular in our countries. It's always the case in the period of crisis, that is clear. We know that the idea of proposing a tax, a new tax to fund Europe is, no, uh, is, no, is not popular anywhere. That's clear, that's obvious. But we know also that if we want to come out of the crisis by the top, we need more Europe more integration, a new step forward in Europe. And of course, according to a democratic process. The current system is half democratic. There is a European Parliament elected directly by the citizens. It shares the legislative competence with the Council of Ministers representing the states. Okay. But the policies decided by this parliament and this council of ministers are not funded according a democratic decision-making process. We need also to uh, make this decision-making process fully democratic. And that is the, uh, the, the, the scheme, uh, the, the proposal I am making uh, before you uh, to, to strengthen Europe when we need uh, this, uh, these strengthenings in inventing a, a, a very original model of solidarity based on financial solidarity and also on fiscal solidarity. Thank you.